The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you might be. Um, thanks for joining us today uh, for jumpstarting your security strategy with NIST. Um, very excited to have this session today. Um, just so you all know, um, before we dive into the content, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this session today is being recorded. Uh, so after the webinar, uh, probably tomorrow, you will get a recording, uh, an email from us um, that will contain the recording. And we will also have um, Q&A at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please use the question panel on your GoToWebinar um, on your GoToWebinar tool there, and you can type those in, and we'll save those uh, to the end. Uh, if for some reason we don't get to your question, uh, we will respond to you uh, via email uh, within the next day or so. Um, and I believe uh, that's all I have. So I'd like to introduce uh, our host for today, uh, Sam Curry, uh, Chief Security Officer of Cyber Reason. Sam, how are you? Good, Lauren. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Thank you. Um, so let, let's dive right in if, if you could go to the next slide. Um, uh, as uh, Lauren just introduced me, I'm the Chief Security Officer for Cyber Reason, and I'm joined today by John Banghart, who is um, former, actually the former presidential advisor on cybersecurity uh, in the Obama administration, and um, he's really continued um, his legacy um, in bridging security with policy and law. Um, in the private sector since then. And John will be presenting today, as well as Shlomi Avivi, who I have the great pleasure of working with every day, who is a VP of Information Security here at Cyber Reason as well. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Morning, Sam, thank you, happy to be here. Morning, yeah, thank you. All right, so Lauren, if you go to the next slide. So uh, just as a quick agenda before I hand this off to the uh, to my fellow presenters, um, uh, the very first thing we're going to go into is a, a simple introduction to security frameworks from Shlomi, uh, and then John is going to lead us through the NIST framework and some of the pros and cons of that, um, and then how to jumpstart things with your implementation. And then uh, at the end, uh, Shlomi will talk a little bit about how Cyber Reason can help with using the NIST framework and helping to um, really use it as a tool to get to the next stage. Um, uh, we all, of course, given that this is uh, not strictly a presentation, it's also a panel, uh, we all, of course, may provide commentary throughout, but that should be a good guide. And we've left a, a healthy amount of time at the end for questions and answers. So uh, don't be shy with those. Uh, make your submissions early and often. And uh, as Lauren said earlier, if we don't have time on this uh, webinar to get to all of them, we will get to them afterwards when we distribute the recording as well. So uh, next slide, please. So with that, uh, Shlomi, uh, why don't you lead us through an introduction to security frameworks? Great. Um, so security frameworks um, in general um, are here to serve uh, two different targets. Um, one target is coming from the organizations using the security framework, and one coming from the outside. So for organizations who choose to use security framework, um, usually the idea is um, since not every organization has the uh, enough in-depth knowledge and enough capacity in terms of uh, uh, security experts to touch on uh, all of the uh, all of the wide range of security controls and all of the uh, different phases where security is relevant, uh, the security frameworks kind of put things um, into order. Um, they are very, uh, uh, the good ones are very comprehensive. Uh, they touch on a lot of uh, different items. And if you follow um, a security framework, uh, usually you would get to cover uh, the wider range uh, of your, uh, um, of the relevant uh, um, security areas, I would say. Um, and we we'll probably not miss out on anything, uh, which could happen if you would do it uh, on your own. Um, for third parties, uh, security frameworks come to serve a different purpose. Um, and the idea is that if you are a third party and you want to understand uh, the security posture, posture of a vendor you are considering working with or a partner, then you can either um, do a deep dive uh, we dive into all of these aspects uh, and spend a uh, considerable amount of time auditing uh, 
um, this partner or vendor, or you can simply um, ask them or check their uh, compliance status with a known security framework. Uh, because for example, if, an, if, an, if I'm to uh, audit um, a vendor or a partner, and I know that they comply with, uh, with the NIST framework, if we're talking about the NIST now, uh, then I know pretty much what they have touched on, uh, what areas they are good uh, and they're covering, um, and what types of security controls I could find there. Um, so this kind of serves uh, both parties um, in the sense of uh, giving um, a good uh, security coverage and a good idea uh, of it to uh, to third parties. Um, and so organizations, as I said, are using uh, security frameworks uh, to manage uh, the, the risk. Um, security frameworks also uh, usually provide um, the, an understanding of the uh, risks that each, um, each section is about to handle um, and the priority or severity uh, of these risks. So for example, if you are to prioritize your security work plan, which is something that every, uh, every system needs to do eventually, um, then that is a, good, um, is a good place to start looking and understanding, um, or at least uh, confirming your, your uh, own ideas as to what is uh, considered uh, more risky uh, or prioritized higher usually. Um, now, the security uh, frameworks uh, can be divided into two types. Uh, there are generic ones and ones that are industry specific. Uh, among the industry specific, we can find um, frameworks like uh, PCI DSS or HIPAA, uh, which are aimed um, to provide a security. Uh, standard uh, for a specific uh, industry, its own uh, nuances, its own risks, and, and it's usually also uh, more tied to the relevant um, uh, technological uh, components in that industry. Uh, the generic ones are usually a bit broader in the range that they are, they are covering and a bit less attached um, to specific security controls, uh, but more to requirements that can be met in more than one way. And among these, we can find, obviously, uh, the NIST uh, framework. Uh, we can find um, other uh, more security standards like uh, ISO 27001 and such. And, uh, and basically, uh, each uh, organization uh, would need to choose, would probably need to address the ones that are uh, industry specific to the industry they're in, uh, but it would also want to choose uh, one generic one that can cover uh, the wider range uh, of the organization operation. Okay, so let me, <clears throat> this is Sam. I would add that. Um, I like the distinction, by the way, between um, <clears throat> those that are uh, internal focused versus external. I, I used to jokingly refer to them as crack the whip and bayonet the wounded. Um, but the generally speaking, the history of a lot of the industry specific ones was when an industry has external constituents who are enforcing something like patient rights or, <clears throat> or looking at uh, the card ecosystem in the case of PCI DSS. With the exception of NIST, which has a government history, and I'm sure John will allude to it, most of the general ones that were built from best practices up, right? They're practitioners who develop them as a tool and a platform for broad security. And so the temptation sometimes is to say, you know, how are we doing? And while you can derive KPIs from them, frameworks are best used to advance the security game, but not to define um, the best in class. Right, you to use it as a lowest common denominator, and then to get better, especially as you mentioned, when you are, have certain talent deficits or gaps, um, the ability to come back and say, okay, we've we, we've filled all these parts. Now, how do we tighten it up? And then when we do a risk assessment and we look at the threat landscape, where do we see deficits, and which can we go and do better? 
um, to advance the state of the art, especially with the general ones, is very, very helpful. Um, just wanted to add that as a, as a comment. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, as I said, there is one more than one way to address each each uh, requirement or each part. And there is obviously there are obviously ways that, that are better than others, ways that are uh, more costly than others. Then definitely, uh, it's an ever evolving uh, process of improvement. Um, and that's also something that is addressed um, in some of the frameworks. Great, well, thank you um, for that. And uh, absolutely agree both with Sam and, and Shlomi in terms of both the, the value of frameworks uh, and what they can bring, but also um, how some of those limitations factor in and how organizations can make use of them. So let's pivot a little bit and talk specifically about uh, one framework in particular, which I think most of you here came to hear about today, and that's the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. Um, a little bit of background I think might be valuable for those that maybe are less familiar. Uh, NIST, of course, is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It is a government agency, part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, they are primarily focused on, as the name implies, uh, developing standards, doing research and development uh, across a wide range of areas, including physics and the robotics and all sorts of things. Uh, but they also have a very large and very robust group that focuses on information technology and in particular cybersecurity. And so those folks at NIST have been working on cybersecurity related standards now for decades. And if you've been in government at all, uh, you certainly will be very familiar with the NIST 800 series. Uh, even in the private sector, the NIST 800 series has been widely adopted and used as a reference. So it made sense that when in 2013, the Obama administration was looking for ways to address threats to the nation's critical infrastructure, uh, that they would turn to NIST to help guide that effort. So again, in 2013, uh, President Obama issued Executive Order 13636, uh, which was called Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity. I had a couple of different provisions in it, uh, but the one that we care about today was the one that basically charged NIST to go out and they had a year to build a cybersecurity framework that would help to defend our critical infrastructure. Uh, no small task, to be sure. Um, keeping with NIST tradition, they went directly to the private sector, which they do uh, all the time in terms of working on standards. Uh, and said, look, this needs to be a joint effort. This cannot just be about government. In the United States in particular, most critical infrastructure is owned and or operated by the private sector. So it would not have made any sense for government, no matter how smart, no matter how dedicated, to try and come forth with a framework uh, that was really meant to protect, or uh, excuse me, really meant to help manage risk for the critical infrastructure in the private sector. So over the course of that year, uh, NIST began working uh, across all different sectors, uh, about 13 different sectors in particular, all identified as critical infrastructure by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they ran five multi-day workshops, uh, all told thousands of people from both government and industry participated in the development of this framework. And that's important because it's that involvement, it was that bringing of folks together from those sectors, and not just technical folks, but policy folks, operators, everybody from top to bottom who was invested in this. And I think that has played a large part in why the NIST cybersecurity framework uh, has become particularly useful. Um, and in fact, has seen significant adoption. About 30% of organizations use the NIST framework in some capacity. We'll talk a little bit about exactly what that means because not everybody uses it in the same way. So that's the history on it. So what does it do? So if you've ever looked at it, uh, and there's two versions now, the version 1.0 came out in 2014. Uh, during the interim years, uh, there was a lot of additional development, additional discussion uh, leading to the release of version 1.1 earlier this year. Um, in particular, 1.1 pivoted uh, a lot into talking about supply chain, some vulnerability management, additional uh, aspects around identity and access management. Um, so very still much the same framework. They didn't change the structure. They didn't change uh, the, the core pieces of it, but rather tweaked a few things here and there and added some additional elements in order to broaden the scope of the framework. That broadening of scope was important because as I've said, although it was developed for critical infrastructure, uh, 
what we quickly found was that it was being looked at and used uh, across companies, organizations, government agencies uh, that were not considered critical infrastructure. Uh, lots of folks were seeing the value in this. And so NIST took that uh, feedback and said, we need to broaden this a little bit. We need to think a little bit more broadly in terms of who's going to be using this. And importantly, what are some of the challenges that we're faced with, right? Considering supply chain, um, internet of things, and so on. The other key piece of this is that this is a voluntary framework, right? So if you work in the policy spa space, if you work in government affairs, um, you know that there's a lot of push and pull between regulation, best practices, guidance, things like that. NIST, uh, by its nature, is not a regulatory agency. So nothing that NIST publishes, nothing that they say, uh, becomes regulation, becomes required. Whether or not other sectors choose to take what they produce and make it required, uh, is a separate matter entirely. But the framework itself is entirely voluntary, it's entirely risk-based. Again, if you go and look at it, what you'll find is that there's a hundred and some odd controls at this point, they call them subcategories, uh, and they're broken across a number of different functions, which I'll touch on next. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the way the framework is broken down is it's broken down by functions, categories, subcategories, and then informative references. So I'm going to talk about all of them, but let's take a look at the functions and we'll kind of build my way down from there. So if you work in cybersecurity, which I imagine most of you do, uh, these things should sound pretty intuitive. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And they are exactly as they sound. While they are not necessarily presented in any particular sequence, there is a natural dependency that emerges in terms of how you go through the framework and look at using it. Identify, as the name suggests, is what do we know about our systems? What do we know about our processes? Do we have the right plans in place? Do we have the right governance models, asset inventory, things along those lines? Everything that helps you to understand the basics and the foundation of what it is you're trying to protect what it is you care about. Protect are all of those different pieces that you would put in place to help, as the name says, protect the things that you care about. And those can be technology centric. Most of the subcategories in protect are technology centric, but they can also be process centric as well, right? Are you, for example, looking at the outputs of your protection mechanisms, firewall logs, things like that, uh, and are you learning from them? Do you have a process for improvement so that you're not just firing and forgetting, dropping a technology in place and hoping that it continues to work. Uh, and that's true throughout all the functions. Detect, are you monitoring your networks? Are you monitoring your systems? Are you monitoring your people to make sure that they're both complying with policy, uh, but also looking for anomalous behavior and so on? And then respond, which is how do you respond when something bad happens? And again, it's a combination of technology and process you have response plans. Uh, do people know what's in those response plans? Does everyone in your organization know where they fit? What are they supposed to do if there is an incident? Um, and so that is part of it as well. And then, of course, recover. And recover is an incident has happened, something bad has occurred, but that's done now. Uh, how are we going to get back to good? How are we going to get back to normal? And that includes technology pieces. It includes public relations and so on. One thing I'll note before we move on is that you'll see that there is an uneven, if you go and look, you'll, you'll see that there is an uneven distribution in terms of the number of subcategories in each of the functions, right? It's particularly weighted towards identify and protect, with then detect being next and then respond and recover being the smallest in terms of the total number of subcategories. While not intentional from the get-go when we were developing the framework, um, it made sense as we were progressing and we were looking at, well, geez, you know, we're getting more subcategories in these functions than others. But it was natural, right? It was natural in terms of some of those interdependencies that I talked about. You have to understand your risk. You have to have the protection and detection mechanisms in place if you ever have any hope of responding and recovering. I think, and this is just my opinion, but I think that as the, uh, the framework continues to mature over time, I think we'll find more subcategories being introduced uh, into some of the other functions, and that will balance out, particularly as we start to turn our attention um, not just to protecting and detecting, but also to ideas of resilience, right? How do we respond in ways that are going to be, uh, or how can the organization be resilient in both its response and as it recovers? Next slide. 
So I think I've probably touched on some of these, but let me just highlight some of the pros of the NIST framework. Again, because it was developed by so many people across so many sectors, uh, it really is a collection of the best practices of the, of the time, the 1.0 and now the 1.1. And importantly, I mentioned earlier one of the other columns I didn't touch on in the framework, which is the informative references. If you go and look, NIST has done a great job with help from a lot of folks in the international standards uh, world to identify key references, including ISO standards, CIS standards, COBIT, uh, HHS, and so on, so that when you're looking at the NIST subcategories, you can go and get more information. You can turn to other standards that might talk about how do you implement, how do you measure, how do you do these other things. So they've done a really good job, and that is part of what makes it so adaptable, flexible, and scalable. Right? You can use the framework as sort of your overarching lens through which you're managing risk, um, but build it in conjunction with or overlaid with other standards that you may already be using, like ISO, for example, or even PCI DSS, which we mentioned. And that adaptive, adaptability and flexibility, ultimately, if done correctly, leads to cost effectiveness. Because if you're managing your risk in an organized way, right? if you're implementing in an organized way, you have a better chance of controlling costs, right, and putting things into place that are what you really need. And like Shlomi said earlier, frameworks can help you prioritize, and that in and of itself is a cost savings and cost effective measure. Um, and then finally, promoting technology innovation. The other thing about the framework is that it is technology agnostic. It doesn't say you should use this particular tool or that particular tool. Um, it says, here's the kinds of capabilities that you should have. Here's the kinds of processes that you should have. Here's the sort of things that you should be looking at in terms of outcomes. So it really does allow for innovation to occur in ways that may not always be foreseeable. Um, so it's very open in that regard. Um, so um, Shlomi, let me turn it over to you to talk a little bit about some of the things that the framework maybe doesn't do. Yeah, so uh, as I do agree with everything you said in the pros, uh, we need to always remember that uh, a security framework is a security framework uh, and it has its own, uh, uh, I would say it, it covers what it covers, but it doesn't cover what it doesn't cover. So um, to, to, to be more um, uh, accurate, so um, first of all, uh, we said that security frameworks come with requirements. They don't come with solutions. You need to find the, the right solution for you how, as how to answer uh, each of the requirements. Uh, so in that sense, um, having met all the requirements of a security framework is not a magic bullet. Uh, you can be in a situation where you have answered all the requirements to some extent, in some level, but you're still exposed. So it doesn't relieve you of, the, of your duty to do uh, proper uh, risk management and have a, an ever-evolving um, security work plan where you tighten things up um, all the time. Um, the second thing is that um, as much as uh, NIST is very broad, very wide and very acceptable, um, it doesn't always uh, relieve you of the need to address other security frameworks as well. Uh, we talked earlier a bit about uh, industry specific one. So if we take, um, uh, HIPAA uh, or PCI DSS, for example, then even if you, um, as a medical organization, even if you uh, address each and every section, each and every sub requirement within this and you do it the best way, you still need to go through a HIPAA uh, certification process. Um, and these processes, uh, they are, they can be uh, costly, they are uh, obviously. Uh, um, they obviously require a lot of efforts and a lot of time to address them because sometimes there are nuances between one and the other. Uh, and you may find yourself in a situation where you need to uh, have um, a set of documents for this framework and a set of documents which look slightly different for this framework. Uh, and you need to do some processes that uh, can be overlapping. And you would definitely need to invest in audits, which are also. Um, which are also a project in their own. Um, so, so that is uh, again a, not a downside, but it's kind of a uh, putting the perspective into 
into what you can do uh, with the uh, within this framework. Um, and and another point to remember is that uh, as John described, uh, NIST was uh, uh, a result of uh, many many hours of many many experts in different fields coming with uh, a comprehensive um, list uh, and a coherent list of uh, of what you need to do to address cyber attacks. Now, as cyber attacks grow and change and evolve, um, the frameworks uh, evolve with them. Uh, now, we have uh, already more than uh, more than one um, version of the of this framework, and we probably have um, future versions uh, be released uh, as time goes by. Uh, sometimes with minor changes, sometimes with uh, major changes. Um, we've seen it happen um, in, in PCI DSS uh, a couple of times. We've seen it happen in other frameworks. Um, the, uh, the idea behind frameworks is to always be relevant. Uh, so as uh, attacks change and as new areas come to play when it comes to security, for example, um, IoT. And for example, um, you know, a, a deeper analysis uh, that these are requirements that we didn't have back in two years ago, three years ago, which are now uh, making their way into several security frameworks, uh, then it's expected that the NIST framework would also evolve. So having met the NIST framework at one point in time would not mean that you do not need to be in touch and see what's going on and prepare yourself for the newer version uh, when it did come. Yeah, Shlomi, I think that's exactly right. Um, and I think that the one thing I just want to highlight too is um, you talked about the fact that there are sector specific requirements out there. Uh, there are regulated industries as we well know. Um, in the case of HIPAA, for example, uh, very early on, after the the, frame, the initial framework was released, uh, Health and Human Services actually went out and mapped the HIPAA security rule into the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, and so that is an authoritative source that you can go to on the, the HHS website. Um, and we've seen others do something very similar. And so we'll go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, one of those examples. Um, so, or, well, after this, let me, let me touch on how to implement it first, and then I'll explain how uh, some folks are actually going about this and some of the results that they're seeing. So one of the things I didn't mention earlier that I think is really important about the framework is this notion of building profiles. It's actually built into how the framework operates. The idea being that of the 100 plus controls that are in version 1.1, um, no one is ever going to use all of them. Everybody's risk profile is a little different, even within the same sector. Uh, it's very uncommon that everyone will say, we all need exactly the same set of controls. There's baselines, there may be some very common things that everyone looks to, but overall, uh, your risk profile is gonna look a, bit of, a little bit different. And NIST allows for that and has an actual structure and a way of approaching it. Um, and so the way that you do that is you use the framework, use whatever other mechanisms you have to go out, create a gap analysis. Look at what does the framework say? What is it that we think we need to do? And where are we in terms of our risk profile? And then that becomes your current profile. And it also provides a way for you to create a target profile. Where do you want to be, right? On your maturity scale, are you everywhere that you think that you should be in terms of all of your cybersecurity program elements? Uh, or are there gaps there? And for the most people, the answer is yes. The answer is almost always yes, that there's some gaps, there's always some way to improve. Um, and so NIST allows you to do that by mapping, not just to the five functions, but all the way down through the subcategory level, creating a profile, and then creating that target profile, something to build to. And just as Shlomi was describing, that is an ongoing process, right? If you work in risk management, you know that it's never just, hey, uh, we're good today, which means we're good forever, right? We know that's not the case. And so it's designed to be this process where you're constantly assessing, you're constantly setting new targets um, on a regular basis. Um, and that's exactly the point uh, that the framework tries to drive you to. It's here's the pieces that are important, figure out which ones are important to you, and then build that roadmap, build that target profile, and continue to develop that uh, and repeat as threats evolve or as your risk profile uh, evolves. Mergers, acquisitions, new business units, old business units, organizations are always in flux. 
big and small. And so making sure that you're constantly thinking about that evolving change, framework allows for that. It's actually very helpful. The next slide, please. So quickly, let me just touch on a couple of things where I have seen uh, in my own work uh, where the NIST cybersecurity framework is, is being used and being used effectively. Um, the first is within the financial services sector. Uh, if you follow cybersecurity at all, you know that the financial services sector tends to be uh, forward leaning when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, far from perfect, of course, no one is, no one's expected to be, um, but they're often very much looking ahead. They're thinking about what's the next thing? How do we, how do we solve some of our cybersecurity challenges? And one of their cybersecurity challenges is the fact that they are the uh, one of, if not the most highly regulated industries in the world. If you've ever worked at a bank, uh, you will know that they have entire armies of people whose job is responding to audits, dealing with compliance requests. That is a lot of effort that goes into that. It's a lot of resources that they have to spend. And so what they've done is they've taken the NIST cybersecurity framework. They started this process a little while ago, probably about a year or two ago, um, through the Financial Services Roundtable, which is now recently renamed to the Bank Policy Institute. Um, and they got together, their experts, their policy people, their technology people, their operations people, uh, and said, this framework is great. Let's see how we can use it. And so they took this process on. They've developed what's called the financial services sector uh, specific profile. Um, you can go out and search for that and find it. And what you'll see is that they've done some really interesting things. They've kept the core. They've added some pieces to it. Uh, in fact, they've added another function uh, that they thought was important to try and drive some of the things that matter most to their industry. Uh, and they also did a lot of their own int mappings, for example, to FFIEC and other financially, uh, financial sector specific regulations uh, and, and guidelines. So they're using the core, they haven't changed the core at all, but they're building it, they're using that as the foundation to build something that is applicable, that they can use as effectively as possible uh, inside the financial services sector. Uh, and it's a profile, just as I described earlier, they're taking that, they're building something that is specific to them. Um, the other case that I'll just mention very quickly where I've seen this a lot, and I think Shlomi hinted at it earlier when we were talking about third parties, is one of the very first values that came, or uh, yeah, values that came out of the framework was this idea that this is a really useful lexicon, right? This is a really useful sort of Rosetta Stone to start talking about risk. If we can all sort of get behind this way of thinking about these subcategories or controls, uh, we can start talking to each other in ways that make sense. And this is incredibly important when we think about third party risk. If you and your business partners are using different standards, if you're using different ways of managing your cybersecurity risk, it becomes very difficult to assess, is that third party doing the things that I want them to do? You can write all the contract language you want, uh, but if it's not grounded in something that is a shared understanding, that is a shared approach, uh, it's very difficult to manage. So one of the things we do here is we spend, it's not just us, this is happening everywhere, uh, is that the framework is now being used as that lexicon, right? Folks are saying, look, whether or not we are using all of the framework to manage our internal risk, we wanna start using it for managing our third party risk and asking our third parties to do the same thing. Meet us in the middle around the NIST cybersecurity framework, translate what you're doing into this lexicon so that we can actually make sense of it and start talking the same language. Uh, and been fairly successful in that regard. And I think that as third-party risk continues to be uh, a, a critical issue, uh, which I think it will be, um, I think we're going to continue to see the NIST cybersecurity framework play a really, really important role there because it, it serves that purpose really well. All right. So how can we, at Cyber Reason, uh, help you? Um, meet the NIST requirement. So a few words about uh, Cyber Reason, about how we operate, what our product does, uh, for those of you who were not familiar with it. Um, so we started um, as an EDR company, um, where our product um, um, basically is uh, uh, listening to all, um, pretty much everything that happens on an endpoint. Um, and with the uh, central detection servers, uh, we uh, use all this data to create uh, a multidimensional uh, proprietary graph database 
uh, on which we can run detection rules. So for example, um, if we see uh, processes uh, injecting code from one another in a certain circumstances, um, then we had identified this uh, as a malicious activity and we can alert uh, you, the customer, um, and provide you with the ability to respond to it. Um, where most of the uh, detection rules that we have are things that you would not necessarily see, or in most cases you wouldn't see on traditional security tools. Um, and so, again, we started from, from being just an EDR company, uh, and in time we added uh, uh, several protection abilities. Um, so in addition to being uh, uh, able to provide uh, strong uh, detection abilities, um, we are able to provide uh, remediation abilities, uh, protection uh, from future attacks, um, we have an, an antivirus within our product and uh, a machine learning antivirus module for zero days. Um, actually, uh, learning and analyzing files that were not seen before and being, being able to point out if they are malicious uh, or not. Um, and so, um, basically, our, our product can well, is. Uh, uh, I would say from a security standpoint, can provide a full stack uh, of abilities uh, to the endpoint. Um, now, diving a bit up into the parts that are more relevant for, uh, for the NIST framework. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, uh, a series of uh, detection rules which are um, always evolving as we continue to research uh, and, and see more um, uh, attacks that are out there. Um, and so, in terms of detection, uh, we can provide um, a very, uh, very good picture of what's going on uh, in your organization. Um, and we can also provide you with the ability um, to investigate um, in case where there is no uh, detection rule that uh, popped an alert. But if you feel that something is going on or if you have other indication, uh, of an attack. So our investigation abilities um, are very, very strong and basically allow you to search um, into everything that happened um, on your endpoint. Um, in addition to that, we also have um, um, strong uh, response uh, and remediation capabilities uh, where you can um, from, uh, an, from an attack alert um, block or uh, blacklist uh, a file or a domain, uh, which would be inaccessible from that point on. Uh, you can isolate a machine to, to investigate it uh, from the rest of the network um, and so on. And so um, the uh, um, uh, behavioral uh, Detection capabilities um, are uh, are done across the across the company, across the organization, across the enterprise, and we can also uh, detect attacks that are not just within the uh, scope of one endpoint. Uh, we can actually show you um, the flow of an attack as it goes through um, uh, throughout the organization. Who was hit first? Who was hit next? How was the lateral movement of the attacker? organization and so on um, and all that is done again both with uh, detection rules that are for known attacks and and with uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning that completes uh, uh, the offering uh, for unknown uh, attacks um, now if we look at uh, Tom, Tom, uh, I would just I just wanted to add uh, two things the first is um, yeah, obviously you prevent what's preventable, <clears throat> but what's detected when it's brought forth is, designed, is done with the user in mind to always provide context, right? So you always see how did this get here? Where did it go? What's the impact? What's the scale and scope of this, this thing? And then you can fix it. And the second, and I think quite crucial for people to understand, is a, a do no harm approach in a um, pseudo Hippocratic oath way. 
Um, it is our goal to minimize local storage drain, um, local CPU, the chance of collision, uh, network bandwidth, so that it is as lightweight and non-interrupted as possible. Any any form, any tool is going to have some uh, burden. Um, is going to have some chance of, of of making situations worse in terms of drain and interruptions. And so, as a design philosophy, uh, we have decided to minimize that as much as humanly possible. I just wanted to add those two points at the end, uh, but otherwise, uh, a, a good description. Thank you. Um, and uh, just before handing it over to to John to talk about um, um, the exact coverage, just a few few examples. Uh, um, uh, of of what how we, of how we help cover um, really some requirements in each of the functions. So uh, if we look to, if we look at uh, identify, we have a requirement that says uh, threats, both internal and external, are identified and documented. Well, you know if you have cyber you can just check that one out. Um, in protection, for example, um, we have requirement uh, IP-10, which says uh, response and recovery plans are tested. So, with Cyber Reason, uh, your uh, response plans are uh, are done within the product. They are um, very easy to uh, to map and to test. Um, in in detection, uh, we have requirements uh, CM-4, which says uh, malicious code is detected. And well, basically, if you have Cyber Reason, then that's what we do. You can check that one off. Um, and so uh, I'll pass the mic now to, to John to um, uh, speak about more broadly, but just these are just really a few examples of how having cyber reason can simply check off uh, uh, sections within the NIST. Yeah, thanks, Shlomi. And, and what Shlomi is really talking about here is the fact that you know, while we've spent a lot of time today talking about framework uh, in general and sort of broadly risk management, um, and while those things, of course, are absolutely essential, none of that really matters if you can't make it real, right? None of that really matters if you can't implement it, if you can't manage it, um, you know, uh, where the rubber meets the road, if you will. And so, you know, Shlomi was pointing out a couple of the subcategories that we've talked about within the framework uh, and how Cyber Reason helps meet those. And so what you're seeing here uh, is the result, the high-level result of some analysis uh, that we here at Venable did of the Cyber Reason product and thinking about as you look across all of the NIST cybersecurity controls in the framework, you know, where does Cyber Reason plug in? The capabilities that Cyber Reason, Reason uh, excuse me, Cyber Reason offers, how do those help you manage those aspects of the framework? This is incredibly important for a lot of organizations, both in the public and private sector, but in particular right now, government, U.S. government, uh, they have been ordered um, by the administration to use the NIST cybersecurity framework for managing all of their risk. And so they're looking hard right now at, okay, that's great, but what does that mean? How am I going to demonstrate that I'm actually using the, not just using the framework, but that I've got the underlying technology, the underlying telemetry, the underlying pieces that I need to be actually show that the framework is in place, that we're using it, and that we're meeting the requirements. And what you'll see here across this table is that we've done that analysis. We've looked at what were the total number of subcategories in the functions uh, and how many of those uh, did Cyber Reason touch on, either completely or partially. Um, and that's what this is indicating here. You'll note that there's only four functions listed here, right? Um, our analysis indicated that um, Cyber Reason didn't really touch across all five of the functions. And the one missing, of course, is Recover. Uh, that's neither here nor there, right? Remember that the framework is very broad. The framework is designed to cover all possible capabilities. No one product is ever going to meet all of those needs in whole or in part. So this is very much an expected result. Um, so I think that's valuable. I think if you're, if you're looking at the framework, if you're using it now, or you're thinking about how do we want to use it moving forward, it's understanding not just the value of that and how that's going to impact your governance, your processes, and so on, but how do you turn that, the technology that you have or the technology that you're going to procure, how does that fit into that picture and how can you demonstrate it? And I think that's a critical step um, that, that shouldn't get lost in this. And uh, John, uh, uh, Sam again, uh, uh, there's also, uh, for folks who are attending, there's also a white paper uh, that, we've, that we've produced that goes into detail on what 
each of the things that are answered and how they're answered are uh, on as summarized on this table, right? That's a that is available for folks to to see, and we can we can give them the uh, the URL for that. Yeah, that's right. Um, great point, Sam. Um, it's not just this table. There's actually a paper that goes behind it. There's actually an entire matrix that lists out all of the NIST subcategories, uh, includes our analysis of where cyber reason fits and some narrative around explaining that, uh, as well as some additional examples and, and ways of thinking about it. So yeah, we, great point. All right, so uh, we have uh, we have reached the question and answer period. And uh, Lauren, I know um, you've probably been collecting those uh, through the go to uh, go to meeting tool here. Um, do we have any questions uh, for John Shlomiri? We do. We have quite a few, actually. So the first one I want to start off with. Um, this is probably mostly uh, John here. Um, somebody asked, uh, "How often is NIST updated, and how big are the changes, and what do you foresee for future evolution?" Yeah, it's a great question. So as I mentioned, you know, the time period between version 1.0 and 1.1 was almost four years, um, you know, and, and so that, that was a significant period of time. Uh, I think, you know, NIST is committed to trying to update it more frequently. However, I think they really need to strike a balancing act because if, if a framework changes too often, that's going to negatively impact people's ability to use it. You, you don't want to be constantly chasing a moving target. NIST is really good at this. Um, I think we will see additional updates coming, um, but I think it's going to be slow. Whether it'll be another four years, I'm not sure. I'm going to guess no, but I, I, it's it's a yearly, uh, you know, multi-year long process. It's not going to be updates every month or every year for sure. Got it. Um... I don't know, if Sam, show me if you had anything to add, or I can just move to the next question. <laughs> no, John, John nailed it. He, he was part of the process uh, both times previously, so I trust that. Excellent. Um, so this is probably also for John as well. Uh, someone uh, said that one thing you didn't mention that the framework does entail is tiers. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about tiers, you know, what they are and, and how they're used? Yeah, it's a fair point. Um, I didn't really, really go into it. So uh, in the NIST framework, there's this concept of what are called tiers. Uh, that's T-I-E-R-S, not T-E-A-R-S, although some people might argue it's a little bit of both. Um, so the, the idea here was that NIST wanted to have uh, or enable organizations to have some way of measurements too strong of a word, assessing their maturity around their cybersecurity program. And so it's broken down into sort of um, ad hoc, and then there's automation, there's different elements to it. Um, the reality is some organizations have found the tiers to be useful. Uh, others have struggled to find value. Others have looked at trying to build other types of maturity schemes that work better for them in their sector. So I don't generally spend a lot of time on it just for that reason, because it, it tends to be not as popular of a piece of the framework, and it's also less developed. It's less clear um, how organizations should go about using it. But it is in there. It's, it's well-defined. They did make some adjustments to it, uh, in particular to include some supply chain elements uh, in version 1.1. So uh, again, it's there if you're interested in learning more about it and looking at how it might be applicable. But it, it, it's, it's not a separate piece. It's dependent upon using the core of the framework as well as the profiles. So focusing in those areas first probably makes the most sense. And John, um, I would add that, uh, that, that one of the reasons is it might have had mixed results is uh, you're not, you're not, you don't get more mature simply by getting to better tiers. Um, that there is organizational maturity and, and there are cultural cultural issues often, as well as alignment to core business or mission for an organization. So that if you're not using them <clears throat> in an organization that can make use of them to be more mature, then it effectively becomes a, a scoring system. And I joked earlier about external controls being for bayoneting the wounded. Um, it's painful to do that to yourself, right? So. Uh, if you don't, if you don't have the organizational maturity for it, this won't give it to you. But if you do, it can be very useful. Yeah, that's right. Great point. Uh, another person asks. Um, so this is actually a good question. Um, what is NIST doing at the moment uh, with respect to IoT devices and legacy-based systems such as PLCs functioning in utility orgs to create better standards for preventing hacking that is in the news these days? Yeah, it's a good question, um, and, and the, the answer is a lot. Uh, they're, they're doing sort of the NIST thing. They, in fact, we just had an IoT workshop um, last week or the week before, I don't recall, but it was a, a day-long workshop that talked a lot about the risk of IoT. They published a paper uh, 
I don't recall the exact name of it. I'm sure you can find it on the NIST.gov website. Um, but they published a paper uh, that's sort of just a discussion paper around here's the pieces that we think matter when it comes to IoT security. Um, they also released what is effectively a survey document of existing standards around IoT. Um, and it's not just IoT. NIST uses a couple different terms. We've all sort of settled on IoT, but they often talk about cyber physical systems, which you know are related, or it could be, as you were saying, um, you know, uh, SCADA systems, other types of systems in an industrial context. They sort of throw all of that together. So the answer is they're doing a lot uh, across NIST, and um, there's plenty out there. There's plenty of ways to get involved. Like I said, they typically run these workshops. They're open to everyone. Uh, you can come and be a part of this process. They're not the only ones. Other parts of government, like the NTIA, uh, I've been involved in some of their efforts around IoT. We just finished up a multi-stakeholder effort uh, late last year around the upgradability of IoT devices and some of the criteria around that. So there's a lot of efforts within the government to focus on this that are very open, very transparent, uh, and certainly looking for, for input from folks uh, across any industry. And um, and Lauren, I would I would add that I, I would like to see much as we did as NIST did with mobile security, uh, more emphasis on hardware roots of trust and making those extensible. Uh, and frankly, I think we could wind up in a situation where we have internet pollution, right? If we have devices that ship with things like default passwords and are not upgradable and have have um, vulnerabilities that last into decades, um, it could become a, a really horrible environment from a perspective of of DDoS and identity theft and, and launching platforms that will persist for generations. So um, I'm really looking forward to what NIST will produce here. And they have models, as John mentioned, for some other areas that are almost subsets of what we think of as IoT in the private sector. Uh, so there's a lot, lot that can be done here, and I think that we're going to see them lean forward. Uh, I totally agree. Just, just to add to that, um, you know, usually it was uh, the other way around, that um, the industry met the standards. Um, and here, I think we are in the maturity level where the standards are beginning to catch up and kind of even lead the industry um, you know, before, uh, you know, IoT security problems become mayhem. Um, so that would be a good, a good opportunity to kind of um, you know, jump ahead before the problem becomes, uh, uh, becomes a critical problem. Got it. And I think we just have time just for about one more question here. Um, someone asks, uh, if I'm evaluating a software vendor, how do I know that they are compatible with NIST? Well, so I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that first from my perspective. And then certainly if Sam or Shlomi have other ways from, from Cyber Reason's perspective, it'd be great to hear that as well. Um, I think the first thing that you need to do is, is go back here to what you've learned today and think about how do you want to approach this. And I think you start with, let's get the framework, let's think about what it means to us, right? Let's learn about our own risk profile, our own risk environment. What do we know and what do we not know? Identify those gaps, right? And figure out where are the priority areas, right? You hear terms crown jewels and so on, but figure out what it is you want to protect, whether that's data, whether that's a service, uh, whatever it may be. Um, Figure that out first, figure out what you need to protect it, and then figure out what, what do you have today and what that gap is. That's going to give you the sort of insight that you need to be able to speak to vendors um, from a place of, of being informed and a place of being educated, right? Because you'll be able to say to them, look, we're using the NIST cybersecurity framework. Here's the gaps that we've identified. Talk to us about your solution or your solutions will help us to fill in some of these gaps, right? And beyond that, it's just regular vendor due diligence, right? You, you got to figure out that, it, you know, are, are these guys full of it uh, or are they actually going to do what they, they mean to do? Like we described with the, the chart previously and the, the white paper, um, analysis like that can be very useful because, again, it's, it's drawing a very direct distinction between here's what the framework says uh, and here's what, you know, a third-party uh, analyst has done in sort of saying here's how this product meets it. So I think that gets you a long way down the path, and then you do your vendor due diligence after that to make sure that it actually does what it says it's going to do. And and uh, Lauren, I would I would take a slightly different approach. Uh, speaking as a CISO, 
Uh, security is about a conversation. It's about an evolving one where we get better and better. And some vendors out there will have wonderful, you know, glossy sheets that say, hey, we're quote compliant or we hit all the checks. Others may not. Um, and that's not an indication of whether there's anything there. I, I would judge a vendor on the ability to sit at a table with you and talk about how it helps with your NIST framework centered program. How, you know, how does it fit? Where doesn't it fit? And trust the people who say it won't do these things rather than the ones that say, I give you the check mark. Um, again, I think it's a dialogue. I think this is about nuances and it's about um, uh, you deciding what fits into your program rather than someone saying, hey, I'll give you the check or the sticker. Um, I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, it's uh, the, the best use for frameworks in that sense is to have uh, uh, an agreed um, schema of topics and bring and phrases and, um, and 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 sections to talk about. And this is the basis for for the conversation, um, you know, as I just mentioned. And uh, eventually, we each um, need to adapt um, the framework to uh, to our own uh, constraints, the industry, the product, the, the company itself, um, and. Uh, but again, but again, not forget to use it um, in the sense of uh, introducing order and uh, and making sure that the coverage uh, is wide enough to cover all the relevant areas. Excellent. Um, well, thank you guys. Uh, that was that was awesome. Um, and thank you everyone on the call uh, for joining us. Um, so keep an eye out for the recording that should come in the next day or so. We'll send the white paper that Sam mentioned um, along as well. Um, for those of you who have Gmail, that's some, uh, the email can sometimes get caught in your promotions folder. So just keep a look out for that in case you're wondering where it is. Um, and I believe that's it. So uh, again, thank you, everyone. And thank you, uh, Sam, Shlomi, and John. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.